Hello and thank you for attending our first A New Winter Approach Digital Summit, a follow-on from our recent live event in London. I'd like to welcome you to our first session of the week, Are You Achieving Legislative Compliance? We'll be discussing how such compliance affects the winter maintenance industry and how the sustainable solutions you can implement to ensure you're meeting winter guidelines. We've got some great speakers presenting today, kicking off with Richard Hayes, the former Chief Executive of the Institute of Highways Engineers, who will talk to you about how you can prepare for this winter season. I will be discussing how local authorities can remotely work this winter. Then Paddy Hasty from Peacock Salt will take over and discuss the cost versus benefit and compliance of pre-wet salt. Please make sure you stick around for the live Q&A session, which is coming up next. We'll all be on hand to answer your questions. You will have been sent a separate link for this Q&A session. Please enjoy and I hope you all gain some benefits from today's Digital Summit. Good morning, welcome to this session, which I'm hopefully going to cover in a short uh, while. A little look at what's been happening in the external part of the industry and give you some advice on how perhaps we can approach winter 2020, 2021, having probably had the most difficult year in highway engineering that um, we've anticipated. Well, a number of topics, three in particular. One is the progress that has been made during 2020, despite the things that we've had on movement and networking and uh, other activities. Secondly, I want to look at the challenges that COVID is presenting and will present as we move on to the winter period. And finally, look at active travel, which is becoming the new normal um, in many situations, but perhaps not quite yet being um, developed in such a way that it actively fits nicely into into service. During 2020, um, sat in this little small uh, study stroke studio, stroke bedroom, stroke whatever it, it happens to, to be, um, I've managed to produce or finally edit, probably the right words to use, the next three chapters of the MWSRG and IHE guidance documents, which been published this year and which will replace those elements of Appendix H, which have been the appendix to the Code of Practice uh, until now. Section 2, uh, a new section called Planning for Winter Service Delivery. Section 12 on weather forecasting and road weather information systems. And Section 13 on route selection and optimization. We're nearly at the end of the uh, production of the new materials. Um, Three more are still needed to um, complete the set. And one, which will be a forward and uh, how to use the guide. Section nine, which is treatments for extreme weather, which is causing some concerns among some of the experts. And section 10, one which I think is probably the most needed at this particular stage, is the treatment for cycle wheels and foot wheels. I'll draw you back to section two and one of the main points in the new guidance and something that will help lots of local authorities service providers is a winter self-assessment questionnaire. Often we're asked to uh, determine whether our services meet the, the guidance documents and whether they are fit for purpose. And these questions, there are 14, 15 questions in the uh, in the exercise. If you were able to answer those successfully, um, it should help you to give confidence both to yourselves and to your um, councillors and other officers that the service is being delivered in, in an appropriate manner. There's enough guidance and enough activity in there to assist you to get that particular report. And I would welcome every authority to have a look at this. It's been part of our training for a number of years, but this time um, it's in the guidance, so it becomes a sort of do or need to understand uh, process, and therefore we'd like authorities to have a look at it. Certainly if there was to be a peer review or any external examination of a service, um, examiners will be looking at how the answers to these particular questions have been uh, identified and uh, what actions have been taken to conform or to comply with the code of practice as best we possibly can. 
Moving on to the COVID challenges, some of the things that I've identified that will cause difficulties perhaps authorities during the next six to nine months, almost forced by some of the restrictions we have in movement and activity, but certainly we could lose workforce personnel, key personnel during this particular process, either isolation activity or simply by the inability to work uh, alongside each other. And that, and the second point, um, improving arrangements that you may have in place, uh, certainly when you are ploughing, other activities may have to be reviewed due to social distancing and other activities um, that the authority has imposed on uh, driving and and, uh, and workforce uh, matters in general. Outside of the internal uh, problem, we've got some significant changes to general tra travelling patterns this year. Um, people are travelling at different times. People are travelling to the same extent. There is um, different traffic flows in the early part of the pandemic went down into the 25 to 30% category. We're now probably at about 75 to 80% of the, the normal traffic problem. is not a straightforward reduction, which is happening over different times of the day. And therefore, the, the timings of events, timings of runs, need to have to be just looked at a bit more carefully to ensure that the activity that's being planned, uh, as well as the um, resulting actions, are generally able to deal with the, the change in these particular patterns. One difficult area is the increase in recreational cycling and walking, which has greatly increased during the last six to nine months. Whether this actually maintains through the winter is difficult to um, determine, but there is an awful lot more people using cycles and walking, and certainly um, policies will have to be looked at in a slightly different manner to account for these particular movements. It is a pity that uh, the section on footways and cyclists has yet to be completed to give complete uh, guidance to uh, the carry on. I mentioned different traffic volumes at different times of the day, and also the issues that we've got more active travel that have come in to reduce and alter road space. Certainly, there are some concerns here that um, space will be different, there will be narrowing in some situations there will be a reduction in, in available road space particularly when um, we get to the plowing situation this is really some a great deal of um, care we can't really be seen to be plowing into cycle lanes and then taking those out although again how do we value the amount of traffic that's going to use those cycle lanes in these situations it's difficult to determine and it has to very much a, a watch and uh, and respond to it. London area has seen the introduction of road traffic networks, which have greatly uh, reduced the number of rat runs. This will have obviously have an effect on routes, and traffic flows, and everything else. And, and um, one would hope that the authorities in that particular area have taken the opportunity to review their routes in view of some of the traffic restrictions that have been put in place. Certain parts of the country are, are also getting e scooter trials, again, which do not really um, throw up significant problems, but another complication to the process um, of managing the road network and making it safe mention a, a license law and uh, injury to vehicles and, and others. And finally, there's been a significant reduction in, in public transport use. So uh, certainly numbers of people using rail and road um, in, in the public sector has gone down. This would have an effect on the routes. Again, it's something that needs to be assessed and some um, valuation, determination made so the authorities are, are aware of what's going on and are reacting to this in a fairly positive manner. Mention active travel. And active travel seems to be becoming the new normal. Significant investment going in to change the um, way that people move around, certainly more cycling and walking areas being created. And this will require existing policies to be revised. There is no way that with the existing process of not doing cycleways because it's impossible to do or we haven't got the equipment or whatever, these are going to have to be brought into um, many service areas. The effect of that could well be increased costs, increased uh, workforce requirements, but also a different regime in terms of how we uh, that particular area. Policies, of course, across authorities, very straightforward. They should be joined up, but 
they should be joined up and if one authority uh, area is looking at increasing cycling it needs to talk with maintenance people to make sure that the maintenance regime satisfies that particular issue i have mentioned this all earlier but will the shift in travel pattern maintained during severe weather who knows that particular issue one would suggest it's probably less likely but plowing of roads with cycle lanes or the new type of cycle lanes that have been put in place the temporary ones will cause certain um, some authorities to maintain um, both uh, the final slide looks at something the institute has been looking at and for the first time we're going to deliver an online winter services decision makers course this is a taster session over um, four short sessions where we'll look at the key points Many of the people who are, newing, who are new to the industry or those who need to have a little bit of background would necessarily not know the full detail. It's the current five-year course, which is still ongoing, and something that we hope to deliver in 2021, which is the transport resilience training to look at the impact of climate change on our highway maintenance and severe weather activities. Full details on the Institute website, but at this particular stage, I'd like to Thank you for, your, for listening to this particular session. I'll be around during the round tables. And if there's any questions you need to ask, here are my contact details. Please get in touch. Thank you very much. Hi and welcome to the second session of the day. I'm Mark Wilcox, Telematics Market Manager at ExactTrack, a specialist division within Avery Waytronics. During the session, I will be covering due diligence and working from home remotely this winter. Specialist topics, how our cloud-based routing tools have evolved, tracking solutions and defending insurance claims, efficiency and savings utilising navigation and automated spreading tools. During COVID-19, all businesses have had to adapt to accommodate social distancing and keeping their workers safe. Remote working comes into its own, although it has its own set of challenges within an authority, especially where vehicles are concerned. Access to vehicles and drivers and all the associated training. As a business, we've conducted a host of both teams and on-site training sessions over recent weeks with limited groups, multiple sessions per day and with all the appropriate social distancing in place. Despite these challenges, local authorities still have responsibilities to keep roads free of snow and ice this winter and we have worked together to ensure drivers are prepared for those cold early morning starts. We launched our MapRoot programme back in 2018, which is a web-based route creation tool, enabling users to simply have full control of creating and amending their own routes. Since this launch, we've now got over 80% of our customers using the product. The key benefits of MapRoute is to increase the route efficiency and management of salt usage. Route statistics calculate accurate journey times and distances eliminate unnecessary free travel, audit trail of all those route amendments. We can export the routes for compliance within our vehicle tracking solution. We also export the routes for driver navigation to allow drivers to simply concentrate on driving, having that driver flexibility, allowing any driver to drive any route. The initial mapper route product enabled routes to be downloaded into the vehicle's navigation solution nav track utilizing a usb stick from customer feedback users wanted to download routes directly into the vehicles from their own pc to improve route updates during the season covering diversions and road network changes themselves with many customers having 40 plus vehicles across five or six depots had the potential for large efficiency saving as some authorities took two to three days to update all their vehicles utilizing the usb method Further feedback related to the license model itself, where users wanted the ability to actually create secondary activity and snow routes. 
We therefore change the route creation license to vehicle based rather than route based, enabling unlimited routes to be downloaded to all of their vehicles. MapperRoute 4G, a cloud based solution, has been developed over the past six months with a customer working group to develop the user interface itself. This has been extremely well received through field trials and a number of our key customers, and we are currently undergoing a full rollout of this solution across this winter. We have also added a host of additional features to MapperRoute from the working group feedback. Configurable route statistics, enhanced route cards, expansion of treatment types. Statistical route information is calculated against individual routes, enabling the route distance to be calculated with overall efficiency and timings to complete from depot to depot and also to depot to the final treatment stage. Configurable values for free travel and spreading average speeds enables that fine tuning against an authority's own winter service plan. The amount of salt required to treat the route is then calculated with the ability to recalculate against a change in spread rate. This is a key aspect with a new gritter control box having one gram per square meter increments on their spread rate. And many authorities reducing rates from 10 grams to eight grams 20 grams to 18 grams. So this overall statistics provides the user to have those calculations. With the current climate, many local authorities are continually challenged with the general public's claim mentality and having the facility to refute claims with supporting evidence is key. ExactTrack can provide the full telematics provision with live vehicle tracking, having a full set of gritter attributes, recording every change in direction along a route to ensure route compliance and the ability to defend any claim that is made. Live deviations and exception reports are generated utilising routes that have been created in MapperRoute, enabling the Rinter Resilience team to react as they are required due to road closures and deviations. One of our key USPs is our data archiving facility, where we guarantee to hold vehicle data for 21 years to ensure an authority can defend a claim with the support from the ExactTrack team. As a business, we continually develop our solutions with user feedback. A recent enhancement to the solution is a feature we call Where is My Gritter? This is a public facing application that can be embedded into an authority's own web portal, enabling the general public to view the routes created across the network and provide live updates of gritters out treating the network in those harsh winter nights. Summary of what we've learned so far. Vehicle management along with route adherence is a key factor for any local authority across its network. Having MapperRoute 4G enables continued route efficiencies and salt savings to be realised. Fine tuning of routes by working with experienced drivers to finalise driver guidance instructions, attribute settings for both free travel and spreading activity along with width and the symmetry is critical. Once amended in Mapper route, the revised route can simply be downloaded directly to the vehicle and tested by the driver and signed off by the management team. This then enables any driver to drive any prescribed route from any depot with confidence. The reporting suite enables users to monitor efficiencies per route with salt usage by vehicle, by depot and across the whole network against selected time periods. How often do authorities have the time to check the amount of salt spread against the same route, conducted by a different vehicle or simply by a different driver? How often do drivers spin off the remaining salt in that last half a mile back to the depot to save time spinning salt back off in the barn? With driver navigation and fully automated spreading implemented, accurate routes again ensures route compliance is maintained. With consistency of route treatments, we have many local authorities seeing a saving of between 22 and 27% salt. With driver navigation and fully automated spreading implemented, again ensures route compliance is maintained. With consistency of route treatments, we have many local authorities seeing a 22-27% salt saving across their network. The key driver in these challenging times is having the above in place, 
the ability for any driver to simply drive any route with confidence. Full risk management can be conducted utilising remote working with all the facilities we have in place. I hope you found the information of interest and look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you. Hello, I'm Paddy Hasty. I'm the Winter Equipment Manager for Peacock Salt. Uh, Peacock are a, a fifth generation family business based in the west coast of Scotland. But we have facilities all around the UK. Uh, we're now the UK's largest salt importer and distribute all grades of salt, up to about 200,000 tonnes if it's a cold year. Uh, so most of the work we do just now with councils and authorities, mostly around uh, salt deliveries as you'd expect, but quite a lot of equipment such as grip bins, push spreaders, uh, right through to cycle path de-icing equipment such as mounted spreaders and snow ploughs. We also manufacture uh, salt saturators uh, for those of you that, that run pre-wet salt winter services. So on the theme of compliance, we wanted to discuss adding liquids into the de-icer mix. So there's, I know there's an awful lot of people that are using liquids for the first time in the winter service and a lot of you that have been using it for a long time as well. And in terms of compliance, there are certain things that you can uh, you can you can choose that which may help uh, making the right decisions. So we wanted to to help uh, help you make informed decisions uh, when considering liquids. So I'll go over uh, some of the deicers that are used just now on the UK. Uh, some liquid deicers applications and go in a bit more detail about pre wet salt, but also come back to what we think you can do to help get it right. Uh, there are a number of benefits to adding liquids into your de mix, which I've kind of summarised to the right of the screen there. Um, not just a, a financial benefit, but some quality benefits also to the winter service. So unsurprisingly, in the UK, the primary de used on main carriageways is rock salt, and most commonly from the two mines in the north of England, but also from the, the mine in Northern Ireland as well. Uh, there are a big chunk of councils and authorities who use pre-wet salt and, uh, and alt other alternative de-icers as well. And we'll, we'll go into a bit more detail about that. So just firstly on liquid de-icers, the, it's important to understand how, how the salt actually works as a de-icer. So salt lowers the freezing temperature of water and in doing so prevents ice from forming. Uh, but the salt needs to enter solution for that process to begin. Uh, and so salt that is already in solution, uh, as it hits the ground, such as a salt brine, it begins to de-ice immediately. Dry salt would tend to need more moisture, either from the road surface or rainfall, or from footfall and traffic for it to begin de-icing. So liquid de-icers that are already in solution activate immediately. So as soon as the impact on the road surface, they start to de-ice. And this can come in, in two forms, either if on formed ice already, as a reactionary treatment, it begins to de-ice, but also as a pre-treatment uh, in, in, in a way to prevent ice from forming in the first place as an anti-icer. But there are many different liquid de-icers that you can choose. Uh, brine, salt brine is the most basic one, but there are uh, alternatives that provide a low corrosive nature to it, but also ones that are more environmentally friendly. If, for example, you are de-icing a, a bridge or a pathway over a, a, a water with marine life uh, underneath, you may want one that's got a lower chemical oxygen demand. Uh, on the diagram on the right there, you can see that the, the principles around brown making centre on getting the concentration to 23% by weight for salt in the water mix. And the reason being is this is the point at which it's most optimal for a de-icer because that's the point at which the freezing temperature is at its lowest. So as a de-icer, it becomes most effective when it's at 23%. 
and liquid deicers have a range of applications. Uh, most commonly in the UK, that takes the form of pre-wet salt. So salt brown is mixed with salt at the point of spreading it onto the ground. You can see from the little image there, that's in a 70-30 ratio, 70% salt, 30% brine. The brine is injected into the salt stream just before it hits the spinner and then applied out onto the ground. As an application by itself, brine can be used in a manner of forms, cycleways, footpaths and pedestrian areas are just some of those examples. The reason they're effective there is because if you're using dry salt, you require traffic or moisture for the de-icing to begin, but brine de-ices immediately. So even if there's no cyclists or pedestrians using that area at the time, the ice will already start to it will already start to begin melting ice or as an anti-icer to prevent ice from forming on, on that part of the network. You can see to the right there there is some different equipment. Uh, you mount you mount sprayers onto uh, tractors, pickups or whatever else. Hill tip uh, are in use there. Hill tip are a finish based manufacturer uh, for uh, a range of winter service equipment. But their spraying equipment is quite advanced using a GPS technology to help make a quite a consistent spread, uh, a consistent spray uh, to, to, to kind of stabilise treatment. So one of the big uses of pre -wet, of, of liquids is in, in pre-wet salt. As I said there, it's the brine at 23% for salt and water and then 70-30 ratio for the salt into brine. Now that actually can be pushed to 50-50 or, uh, or even further with even less salt used, which is in use uh, in other parts of the world as well. So it's a developing area in the UK uh, for, for pre-wet salt. But just now, most commonly it's used in a 70-30 ratio in the UK. And there are many quality and financial benefits of that as well. Uh, primarily, it activates quicker as a de-icer compared to dry salt and it requires less traffic there. It's kind of a hybrid in between full brine and dry salt. Is this pre-wet salt where you've got some brine and some dry de-icer there as well. And it offers it's less, less bounce in comparison to, to dry salt. If you think that the salt is wetter as it hits the ground, it is going to bounce less in the approach uh, and the, the, into a, a more targeted uh, onto the road surface and not bouncing off over the sides of the carriageway. The financial gain is made mainly from the spread rate decrease. Because it's a quicker activation, the properties of pre-wet salt has been found to, uh, you, you require less pre-wet salt than dry salt in some conditions. But also there is there are less salt that you're purchasing in the first place. You need 30% less salt, less brown rock salt uh, to, to carry out pre-wet treatments. <clears throat> but that mainly, uh, the saving mainly, um, that you make from that you do have to put into an investment in order to facilitate pre-wet salt so the uh, equipment that you that most commonly found with pre-wet salt is in the form of a saturator and a combi spreader so you can see the combi spreader it's just like a standard spreader but with saddle tanks around the sides which hold the brine and then a pump to inject the brine into the salt stream uh, the salt saturator salt goes into the top Water gets fed through it and then it, it recycles itself on itself until it, it, it's mixed into that concentration at 23%. But you can see here that even after that investment is made, um, uh, this illustration uh, looks at uh, an authority that uses about 8,000 tonnes of salt on average per year with four depots and 16 spreaders. So there's four salt saturators, 16 spreaders, but there's also that 30% saving year on year from rock salt that's now made, in, now, now made into brine. The, uh, so as you can see here, even if you were to buy overnight all new saturators and all new spreaders, then there is still a significant saving made and that investment's returned within, within the first three years. Uh, as it happens, most of this equipment can be rented or purchased as well. So, in fact, the savings could be uh, redeemed quicker than that. 
So, uh, what some of the suggestions we would make to help you inform, uh, to help inform you of your decision making if you're adding liquids into the deicer mix, is that uh, first of all ensure that you've got the right capacity. So, if you are running continuous brain treatments uh, or pre-wet treatments over the course of a week it would be important to make sure that you've got that resilience uh, to ensure that your brain making facilities can make brain fast enough, but also that you can store the brain so when it's needed, uh, you've got access to it. The, the key part of it all to producing brain is to make it at 23%. Uh, any higher than that, and it risks, uh, or lower, it risks being less effective as a de-icer. So, um, and the long term, the investment decisions should really be long term, and one of those major decisions is in the technology set selection, which can help uh, produce the brain at the twenty three percent. The saturator you see to the right is one of the peacock salt saturators, and we have an automatic dilution valve which will shut off as soon as the the brain's made to the twenty three percent. So all the drivers doing all the all the depot staff are doing is just loading salt into the hopper and the saturator makes the brine. There are also uh, various technologies out there, but it's important to make sure that you've got one that's fit for purpose for producing highway grade, grade de-icer. Uh, it's making sure that we have electronics that are fit for purpose, that are ingress protected. Salt, water and electrics aren't, a, aren't, aren't um, uh, don't have a great relationship. So, uh, making sure that they are separated uh, when they need to be and you know making sure that for example the equipment is designed to work operate outdoors and different the weathers that you get through the winter and, and into freezing temperatures as well uh, it's important to have a good service and backup to make sure that you minimize downtime look with any other technology faults do occur uh, breakdowns do happen and mistakes do happen in using it as well so Making sure that there's a good backup so that you are you're not you don't have to experience a high downtime during the winter service. That's that's key uh, to a pre-wet winter service and a technology with minimal maintenance as well. Uh, we design quite a lot of our equipment to make sure that uh, it reduces downtime, whether that be servicing during the summer, before the winter starts, or after the winter. Uh, Seventy percent of our faults are rectified within the first twenty-four hours. And it takes a lot of hard work to keep that stat up, um, but it's one that's absolutely essential for our customers to support them and make sure that they can get the full cost benefits of running a pre-wet winter service. And cost efficiency is key, uh, making sure that you've got the data at hand to ensure that the, the equipment's being used, used properly and used effectively as well. Uh, we've got a two-way communication module that lets, one, you can control the saturator from your your mobile phone or your tablet computer or your desktop computer, but also it reports on the use. So you know who went out with what brain, with what concentration, at what time, how much was used, how much came back. So there's a lot of intel there to, to inform your decision making and your operations. It's important to check the spread rates that you use and see if you can uh, tailor that. Now, the National Winter Service Research Group, they produce guidance, which uh, is well worth taking a look at. In some conditions, you can reduce your spread rates for de-icing uh, if you're using pre-wet salt in comparison to dry salt. And it's, it's very important to treatment, uh, to evidence your treatments. Um, it can be quite daunting for a, just a member of the public who's passing by a cycleway and, realize, and, and just sees water coming out of a sprayer uh, to what they think might be water may actually be de-icing brine or a chemical, a uh, specialist chemical. So it's important that you can evidence that so that it helps with claims management, with operations management, but also lets you again know um, it's doing its job. Uh, Hill tip, the, the, the equipment manufacturer for that spraying equipment I showed earlier, they have a tracking device which lets, lets people see how much uh, liquid went down or salt, uh, what application rate in millilitres per metre squared or grams per metre squared and it reports it on a, a mapped image with the date and time uh, so that you can rest assured that the treatments, uh, the treatments went down appropriately.
And I think the other thing as well is to, and, and importantly from a compliance point of view, ensure that you have a risk-based approach uh, and to ensure that you can uh, evidence the way that you're informing decisions and about your winter service. So uh, that's all we've got time for, folks. Uh, thank you so much for joining and, and, and staying with us. Um, I'm, we're hosting a live Q&A session just now and the details of how you, how you get to that is have been sent so just check your inbox if you've not got them to hand and I'll see you over there. Thanks. <laughs>